Well, welcome everybody to Phoenixville Public Library. I'm Mark Pinto, the Director of Adult Services here. And uh, this is our first ever open mic night for writers. Uh, I'm appreciative to all the writers who have, are here tonight and who have signed up for this event, which we hope to make a regular occurrence here at the library. Um, show of hands, how many of you here tonight are not one of the people speaking? So you're here to uh, appreciate some of Phoenixville area's finest literary talent, and uh, the area is definitely bursting with talent. A number of our writers have brought their, some of their wares with them tonight uh, in the form of uh, books that they're selling in the back. And please, afterwards tonight, feel free to go back there, uh, introduce, you know, say hello to the writers, and uh, take a look at what they have to offer, and maybe make a purchase. Uh, let's see. Oh, the event tonight, our event tonight was supposed to have been hosted by uh, Eric Parmer, who is the head of our Phoenix Writers Group. Um, those of you who don't know about our Phoenix Writers Group, it's a group that meets here twice a month, and they uh, meet to offer support, advice, encouragement, criticism uh, to uh, writers of, of any genre. Uh, I have flyers on the magazine rack back there about the group. It's free. And uh, if you wish to have your work critiqued, you can submit uh, it to uh, Eric prior to each meeting, and there's information on the flyer about that. And I also wanted to mention that in addition to events like tonight, we also have periodic uh, author events where an author will come to speak about their book for an hour or so, 45 minutes, and uh, also usually sell copies too. And we have one such event actually later this week on Thursday night, April 24th, uh, Christine Schmidt, who is a local author, published a novel called Death of a Drug, and she has some inside knowledge having worked for a pharmaceutical company. Um, it's the uh, setting for the story. That's Thursday night at 7 o'clock. That'll be downstairs in our community education room. Okay, well, we have a lot of writers with us tonight, and we're going to hear, adhere strictly to that five-minute rule uh, that we set. I'll be timing you guys back here. I'm giving you the hook if we uh, need to. Uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order tonight by last name. And uh, thank you for submitting your bios. I'll be reading them pretty much as you, uh, as you sent them to us. So. Uh, any other notes? No, okay. Just thank you all for coming tonight and to, especially to our participants. First up tonight, Virginia Beards. Virginia Beards taught British and European literature for 23 years at the Brandywine campus of Penn State, where she also labored in the trenches of freshman English. Language fun and a fascination which, with what she sees directly and via a sideways glance are the focus of her recently published Exit Pursuit by a Bear and Others, or Read Press. She has published short stories in Chester County Fiction, edited a 19th century novel for Rutgers University Press, and done her small part in the literary criticism industry. She has an MA from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD from Bryn Mawr College. She lives on her farm in Lancaster County, where her practice is writing, dressage, and keeping one step ahead of the vagaries of nature. Virginia.
vitreous humor scar. Cobweb grifters they are, messing with the retina, projecting scenes on the waking up mind. Some mornings it's puck peeking out from under the ferns. On others it's the cave and Plato's forms or puerile playbacks on a dead white wall. Gray bits, miniature barges, filaments gliding through visual flotsam. Today they're towing Toad and Ratty, a fat gray horse named Wave, a treehouse cobbled from purloin nails and wood, a canvas covered log rolled lumberjack style, going so fast I can't see my feet for the foam. An oddball archive, the inward eye, fantastical impresario of drift and flow, discreet, paparazzi adverse, and shutter shy. I think you might be hearing some fantasy type fiction from others tonight. I have a poem that is a little bit fantastical. Uh, it's based on something true that exists, a geographical feature of the world. It's a poem on the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of, the closest we can get to the core of the Earth. It's the trench seven miles long in the Pacific Ocean, and running from the, it's to the uh, east of Guam, seven miles north to south, and at the very bottom, uh, in one part of it, there's a thing called the Challenger Deep, which is, takes you even deeper. This is a telegram someone is sending who's down in the Mariana Trench, okay? Telegram from the Mariana Trench. 11 degrees, 21, 11 degrees, 21 minutes north latitude, 142 minutes, 12 seconds, east longitude. Arduous hike, terrain heavy going, diatomaceous clouds tag each step. Stop. 6.78 miles of water pressure, vertical column drilling scalp to brain, to neck, to shoulder, to chest, to guts, to knees, to toes. Stop. My companions, completely appropriate, weighted species, crawling and trolling. Crabs going sideways, confused but purposeful. Souls so flat they can't see ahead, but go there anyway. Some diversion from one-inch amoebas and lobsters as big as Schwarzenegger's arm. Stop. Guam's up there somewhere to the east. Palm trees, white sand beaches, calendar stuff. But I seek the challenger deep. A small slit in a dust-lit canyon affording access to the middle of the planet. Stop. I chose this slog, allured by, quote, Earth's closest approach to its core, unquote. Stuffed my pockets with rocks, jumped in, plummeted down, the goal being centeredness. Stop. Ignorant of Mariana's length, the strength it takes to hike the sea bottom, that passing into the Challenger Deep is more daunting than the camel needle deal. Its fable calm is not for the plotter, and at any rate, entirely unreal. Why don't you calm off? <laughs> <laughs> David was raised in Phoenixville and educated at Devon Prep. 
and the University of Pittsburgh, where he studied language and literature and wrote a BA thesis on Roman and Chinese poetry, which included his own translations from the Latin of Ovid and classical Chinese of Tu Fu. He has also published award-winning original poetry and essays that have appeared in various collegiate magazines and journals in Pennsylvania, and done work as a professional translator and anthologist of Chinese poetry in Western European vernaculars, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. He is currently making a career as a library assistant at Phoenixville Public Library. <laughs> and no ambition of becoming an author, save that of living to think and read, has any influence with him. David Bogart. Two lovers low, cried he, 
her with less claim to live and guilty me. Poor girl, I killed you when I sent you here, alone by night to such a place of fear, not coming first to myself. O oh, rent and tear my guilty flesh, you lions, you whose lair is in this rock, devour me. Yet to pray for death, he added, is the coward's way. He took the mantle, which so well he knew, and bore it to the tree their rendezvous, and kissed it oft, and bathed it with his tears, and saying, Drink my blood as well as hers, he plunged the sword he carried in his side, and fell with face upturned. But ere he died, he wrenched the weapon from the wound away, and blood flashed upward in the crimson spray, as from a water pipe when cracks the lead through the thin rip the hissing steam is spread. The tree was spattered, and the fruit it bore went dark in color with the rain of gore, and from the blood-soaked fruit the purple hue rose up and dyed the berries as they grew. That moment Thisbe, still possessed with fears, but loath to fail of her lover, reappears and looks with eyes alert, and mind as well, her danger, her escape, the God to tell. This is the place, and surely this the tree, but fruit so dark, she doubts if this it be. And while still wavering, sees the limbs that play their death beat on the ground, and shrinks away. As boxwood pale, she shuddered like the seas, when o'er the surface goes the whimpering breeze. But when she stooped and knew her lover there, she beat her blameless breast and tore her hair, clasped the loved body in a fond embrace wept in the wound and kissed the ice-cold face. O oh, Pyramus, what fortune was her cry, has snatched you from me? Pyramus replied, Your Thisbe eye, tis Thisbe calls, she said, so oh, hear my voice and raise her sunken head. At Thisbe's name, his eyes, which death down bore, looked up and saw his love and dropped once more. But she, when now she saw his scattered there and recognized her own mantilla there, cried out again and said, Unhappy one, by your own hand and by your love undone, Courage for this my own true hand can show, and love is mine to nerve it for the blow. I follow in your footsteps to the tomb, the wretched cause and comrade of your doom. And not by death itself, my love, shall we, whom death alone could sunder, sunder be. And you, bereaved ones, parents his and mine, to gain one favor that our prayers combine. And those whom love and whom this fatal day has joined, grudge not within one tomb to lay. And you, O tree, whose boughs of sanguine hue now cover one, and soon shall cover two, with morning fruits forever keep the stain, and guard the memory of two lovers slain. She spoke, and then beneath her breast applied the yet warm blade, and leaned thereon, and died. The parents by her dying plea were moved, and what she asked of heaven the gods approved. The ripening fruit to black from crimson goes, the ashes in a single urn repose. Jim Breslin. <clears throat> Jim Breslin is the author of Elephant Short Stories in Flash Fiction and the founder of the Westchester Story Slam. His first novel, Shoplandia, which was inspired by his 17 years as a television producer at QBC, is being launched at Chester County Book Company on May 15th. Jim Breslin. Hello, thanks for coming out. I've suffered for my art. Now it's your turn. <laughs> All right. How was this? Yes. All right. I'm just going to time myself so the misery won't go on too long. All right. I'm going to put this over here. No, no, it's not. All right, so this is the opening chapter, uh, or the opening scene from the opening chapter. And basically, uh, a young college kid, just graduated from college, he wanted to work at 30 Rock, but he ended up at Shoplandia, this home shopping network in Sellersburg, PA. We didn't quite reach his dreams. All right. Hey, Jake, where are my onions? The eyes of show host Ron Calabri shot right through me. How can I make my mother's classic Italian gravy if I don't have onions? My stomach twisted into knots. Calories grinned into the camera, reassuring America everything was fine. Being chastised on live national TV was a gut-wrenching moment. I jumped down the steps to backstage and sprinted toward the prep kitchen. Jake, are you setting Calories up? The voice asked through headsets. No, honestly, I'm not, I replied, unsure if the person was serious or teasing. Three, three days into this job and I wasn't sure about anything anymore. 
Turning the corner into the prep room, I nearly crashed into show host Tanya. Whoa there, buddy. I barely glanced at her as I splintered into the kitchen. I had chopped the onions, pinched the garlic, scooped the tomato paste, and crushed tomatoes into appropriate containers. Where did I place the onions? I scanned the counter, the counter, but the onions had vanished. Did you find them? Producer Dylan asked through headsets. No, darn it. They must have been tossed out. Can you make the gravy this one time without onions? Whoa, the voices called out. Easy there, Jake. This is a family show. Ha, ah, I snorted into headsets and grabbed a full onion off the counter, searched through three drawers for a sharp knife and two more cabinets for a small bowl. Dylan provided an update. He's heated up the olive oil and sauteed the garlic. He's asking for onions again. I'm slicing them now. Peeling back the skin, I sliced the onion and chopped it small and thin, nearly slicing off my middle finger in the process. I imagined ham and calibers of bowl with onions and the tip of my finger. The aroma of onions seeped into my nostrils. Jake, I'm coming. Give me a minute. Tomato sauce can be made without onions. Feeling a floater in front of my eye, I reflexively poked at it with my finger. Big mistake. My eyes started watering as the knife clattered into the kitchen sink. I grabbed the bowl and ran toward the set of tears streaming down my face. I stumbled past two men in suits who were casually chatting. No running, one of them called. I had no idea who they were, so I ignored them and climbed the steps, two at a time, then slowed as I entered the set. I've drizzled some olive oil in here and heated the pan. Hey, here's Jake now with the onions. The camera stayed on a single shot of calories as he reached out his pudgy sausage fingers. I watched the monitor as my disembodied hand crept into the shot with the bowl. Calabrese looked at me. Jake, my mother would never forgive us if we tried to make her famous gravy without onions. With the spoon, he emptied the onions into the sizzling pan and then inhaled deeply to show his pleasure. My red eyes were just beginning to clear, so I watched him stir. Jake, we're missing the white wine. Seriously, can you grab the cooking wine? He grinned at me and then turned back to the camera and winked. I was tempted to flash him the finger I had nearly amputated, but instead jumped down the steps again and spread it past the suits. One month ago, I'd been content with my life, flirting with girls on campus and playing beer pong in my college apartment basement. I'd done everything I could to squeeze the pleasure out of my precious final college days. On the night before graduation, I climbed the fire escape on the roof of our row house and sat overlooking the little college town. I had drank more than my share of Natty Lights that night, and in drunken tears, I threw myself a one-person pity party. The good life had abruptly ended, and this new transition had been thrust upon me. Now I'm a backstage minion at the beck and call of this portly show host with an ego that's nearly double the size of his waistline. Thanks. Joan Brown has lived in Phoenixville since 1974 and has been a CNA for 16 years. She writes about the lives of the lowest level of nursing staff who do most of the physical labor in long-term care communities and take care of all the daily needs of people who can't take care of themselves. Most of us will have some contact in our lifetime with the energetic and interesting folks who work in the culture of long-term care. Joan Brown. Seeing your grandmother, huh? 
I don't want the baby inhaling Gracie's secondhand pot smoke. She might forget about him or something. And Gracie's good for a few hours. Huh? She raised four kids. She won't smoke in front of the baby. Cindy, the seven to three charge nurse, called her from down the hallway. Gotta go, Mark. I'm loving all that. I'll call you when I can need. I know you've never run a dime dining room since you were only 11 to 7, so I'm putting you with Lucy from South 1. She's been here a long time, worked day shift, before she worked night shift, and she knows what she's doing in the dining room. Walking back down to the dining room, Hannah saw Lucy, a short older woman with curly blonde hair tied back in a ponytail, wheeling residents into the room, placing them at tables and around the outer walls of the large room. As she parked each person, Lucy quickly tied a clothing protector around their neck and smoothed it over their lap. Hi, Hannah. Hannah knew Lucy to say hi to, but had never actually worked with her on 11 to 7. A few of the residents arranged around the far tables were slumped over and dozing. People that never knew what time it was and who couldn't complain were the ones who were pulled out of bed starting about 5.30 by Hannah and her 11 to 7 co-workers. It was now close to 8 a.m., and these early risers had already been sitting around in their wheelchair waiting for breakfast for about two hours. Smells of weak coffee, overcooked sausage, and the unmistakable sense of urine and fecal incontinence swirled about the dining room. No matter how many times you tried to keep people dry and clean, somebody always went to the bathroom in their diaper, even in the dining room. Hannah, we don't have time to individually feed everybody. Just make a sandwich out of anything you can and give it to the residents that will hold it. Lucy came over and rolled up a sausage inside a pancake. She opened a carton of milk and gave a tiny lady a sip of milk and handed her a rolled up pancake sandwich. While Hannah fed a few residents who had a plate of pureed pancakes and gray-looking sausage mush, Lucy worked the room like a really good cocktail waitress, giving just enough attention to each person. Lucy was so efficient and calm that before Hannah had finished feeding four people, most of the people in the dining room were done eating, their bibs off and in the dirty bin, and Lucy was sorting the food cards in the right order for the next meal for dietary. Hannah was trying to get Mr. Abrams to wake up and drink his glass of thickened and sure from Tia, an 11 to 7 night shift CNA, came swooping into the dining room and stood behind the kitchen door hiding. Texting at work had become a real issue. She held her phone and texted furiously. Tia was large, medium brown, and graceful, with a full head of really long braids, and always smelled wonderful, even after a night of changing diapers and lifting heavy bodies for eight hours. Tia shuffled over to Hannah and sat down next to her. I'm going to kill him, Cap. He's not texting back to me, and I just know he's going to creep on me since we stuck here. Hannah knew that one of the times that Mikhail cheated on her, Tia had flattened all of his tires and bent back his waiver blades outside of the building in which he was cheating. Before Hannah could think of something comforting to say that she knew wouldn't matter anyway, Tia was off down the hallway. May I have your attention, please? The nursing supervisor's voice spoke on the intercom. <coughs> All night shift days who stayed over to help day shift may now leave. Thank you for your help. Please complete your tasks and check in with your charge nurse before clocking out. Hannah clocked out and drove slowly to Grandma Louise's house. She was so tired she was afraid she would fall asleep in the 10 minute drive. She hoped she could pack up baby Samuel quickly and just go home. As she drove into the wide driveway late, Aunt Gracie's boyfriend shoveled the snow over to the side of her. Hey there, hard-working lady. You gotta get a man that can support you so you don't have to work at night. Hannah never said anything to defend her husband because Lee had no reason to talk and she didn't want to waste her breath. He worked a few days a week as a pickup day laborer and seemed to live mostly off the generosity of Aunt Gracie. Lee and Aunt Gracie had driven from Chicago for the 4th of July holiday and had been living at Grandma Louise's ever since. Hey baby, you come in here and sit for a minute. Mark's grandmother, Louisa, came from the backyard holding a laundry basket full of large green leaves. This is the last of the cottage. They might last back in the snow, but I'm not going to let them die out there. Grandma Louisa had opened the back door and Hannah walked into the kitchen where Samuel sat in the big chair next to Aunt Gracie, who was chopping up collards into small green ribbons and giving Samuel Cheerios one at a time. He was hopping up and down, smiling at her while she said to him, Give me some sugar, sugar. She would then lean over and kiss him, and he would laugh and reach out for her. An old R&B tune, You're Gonna Lose a Good Thing, played in the busy kitchen. Two huge smoked turkey legs sat on the countertop next to the large pot in which Grandma Louisa would cook the collards. Aunt Gracie moved her chair over so Hannah could lean into the excited boy's outstretched arms. Blue, make Hannah a hot toddy. She needs something going to warm her up and calm her down. Hannah tried to refuse the drink of bourbon, sugar, and hot tea. 
But after a few sips, she felt her body relax and enjoy the slide and just sitting still. Grandma Louisa measured water, hot pepper, flakes, garlic, and vinegar into the large pot before lowering the turkey legs into the boiling seasoned water. Aunt Gracie cleaned up Samuel from his Cheerio snack and placed him in her lap and I snuggled her face into Samuel's soft head of tight curls. She sat in the warm kitchen, sipping her mug of bourbon lace tea, watching Mark's grandmother and her youngest sister, Gracie, cooking together, occasionally singing to a song on the oldie station that they always listen to on the radio. Hannah, you go in and lay on the day bed. I'll put Samuel down for his nap. <clears throat> Hannah walked into the large living room and lay down. She snuggled under one of Louise's crocheted afghans and fell asleep while Marvin gave a smooth voice sang the web of Tommy Terrell out in the kitchen. A former advertising copywriter and television executive, Rob Cadigan, has lived with his family in Phoenixville for more than 20 years. Rob's debut novel, Phoenixville Rising, was published in October and has been very well received by readers here in our community and across the country. He is hard at work on his next novel, Rob Cadigan. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, this is Phoenixville Rising. I just want to thank the library for all the support of this book and also thank the community. Uh, the town's been wonderful, so uh, thank you. What I'd like to read tonight is be the metal plate. <laughs> um, what I'd like to read tonight is my next, the beginning of my next novel, which is not a sequel to Phoenixville Rising, but it uses some of the same characters and it uses the same town. So. When darkness falls over Phoenixville, the emerging shadows claw at the old mill town as though they can't quite let go of yesterday. The twilight begins on the eastern hills of Valley Forge, across the meadows and the monuments and the log cabins reconstructed for the busloads of tourists and schoolchildren. At just about this same time, French Creek goes black emerald, even as the water continues its quiet journey into the Schuylkill River, a thief on the run. The shadows then take our town itself, stretching over the park and the churches, and the holy ground where Phoenix Steel once stood. Westward still the shadows crawl, creeping, as Bridge Street goes dim and the sidewalks turn empty against a spring night's chill. The borough starts to tuck, tuck itself in for the night then, the day's work complete, the bedtime rituals beginning anew. The shade is drawn over the split-level neighborhoods, the trailer park, and the brand new balsa wood mansions and the old farms just across the abandoned railroad tracks. And finally, finally, as the sun sinks behind impossibly tall tough pines at the edges of the township playground, darkness takes the day at last, and Phoenixville goes silent again. Loyola Bain stood outside his daughter's bedroom with his hand on the doorknob. He knew she was still awake listening to her iPod, texting her friends, pretending to be asleep. Emily didn't want to talk to him. She never really did. They weren't like that, too much the same, too far apart. There wasn't a whole lot he could say to her anyway. He still couldn't find the words for himself, let alone anyone else. He'd never been all that good with her. Loyola let go of the doorknob. The master bedroom was at the back end of the townhouse. Two narrow windows framed a king-sized bed and overlooked a patch of a backyard that Loyola tended to with the attention of a Longwood groundskeeper. The bed had been his idea. Jenny had laughed in the store, insisting it was much too big, but Loyola said he felt cramped in anything smaller. Besides, he explained, it would give them a larger playing field. Even as she rolled her eyes for the benefit of the saleswoman, Jenny couldn't help but laugh again. Loyola loved when she left. They bought the bed. Loyola opened the closet door and took down the lockbox from the top shelf. He worked the combination and for the third time in his many days removed his service weapon. He shifted it from his right palm to his left and back again. The clock was solid and heavy, a thousand pounds right there in his hand. He gave it one more quick inspection, 
although he knew everything was in order. Then he placed the weapon back into the lockbox and returned it to the upper shelf. His uniform was pressed and ready and laid out on the bed. The black boots, polished to a high sheen, sat on the floor directly below the pants dangling over the edge of the mattress. Loyola surveyed it all one more time. Then he headed for the bathroom. When he was finished, he turned out all the lights and left the master bedroom for the living room sofa, his makeshift bed for the past few weeks. He didn't stop to say goodnight to his daughter, though he saw the light still glowing beneath her bedroom door. Phoenixville is quiet. The tired Pennsylvania mill town slouches its way in the spring with the weight of another harsh winter still heavy on its shoulders. Soon the windows in the old Victorians along Gay Street will open to warm breezes. Evening patrons will crowd the bars and outdoor cafes in town. Young ball players will practice under the lights of the Babe Ruth fields. Noise will fill the air, the way it once did when the steel mill was alive. But the clanging and the whistles will be replaced with the sounds of summer, car horns and Phillies games, and music spilling out of the coffee house during open mic nights. Soon, for now, but not much longer, Phoenixville is quiet, and the darkness is coming. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, this very room figures in a couple of scenes in his uh, Phoenixville Rising book, so I want to check that out. Maddie Dalrymple is the author of The Sense of Death, a suspense thriller with a paranormal twist. Maddie lives with her husband, Wade Walton, and their dogs in Chester County. Maddie Dalrymple. Uh, the section I'm going to read is featuring Ann Kinnear, who's the main character of The Sense of Death, uh, who is a spirit sensor, and um, a scene she has with one of her fellow, fellow spirit sensors, Garrett Manser. The moonlit night revealed an expanse of carefully manicured grass bordered by a low stone wall, on the other side of which was a grove of short, gnarled, evenly spaced trees, a fruit orchard of some type. Between the trees, Anne could see a flickering light. She crossed her arms against the chill of an evening breeze. Someone's having a bonfire, she said, nodding toward the light. I don't think so, said Manser. Anne looked curiously at him and then back toward the light. He was right. It wasn't a bonfire. She could see now that it was actually a number of separate faint lights moving among the trees, only taking on a bonfire brightness when they came together and then fading as they moved apart. What is it? Let's find out, he said, and descended a few stone steps to the grass, then turned to look at her. She hesitated a moment and then followed him. Mazur strode purposefully forward, but she found she had to pick her way along, the heels of her shoes sinking into the soft ground and twigs scratching her legs. She had gone about 50 yards, glancing up occasionally to make sure she was still headed toward the light, when she came into a clearing next to Mazur and could see the source of the light up close. What do you see, he asked. What do you see, she replied. Ask you first, he said with a ghost of a smile. She scanned the clearing. Faint lights, maybe 20 of them, about five or six feet off the ground, moving slowly back and forth, sort of like a wave, sometimes coming together in the middle of the clearing and sometimes moving apart. They continued watching in silence for a few minutes. Finally, Anne said, what do you see? Soldiers. Soldiers in a battle. Soldiers? How can you tell? Because they don't look like lights to me. They look like men, men in uniform. Anne looked at Mansour and then back at the lights. She had thought of them originally as beautiful, even calming. But the way they moved, coming together and breaking apart, swaying first one way and then the other, they were the movements of men locked in combat. And now she sensed the faint crimson tint of the lights, like a few drops of red paint added to white, like killing anger dimmed by many, many years. How did you know they were here, she said, her voice dropping to a whisper. In the parlor before dinner, one of them came in and said, hurry, they're here, and ran out. Anne smiled. You told the owner that you didn't sense anything. I certainly was not going to give that officious little twit the satisfaction of knowing that his inn is haunted. Anne looked back to the clearing where the lights were beginning to fade, sinking into the ground like fireflies in reverse. Why didn't you tell me? I was curious if you would see it. Anne watched the last light flicker out as Mazur turned back to the inn. Plus, they weren't lights to me. I could follow their sound, but it was faint. I thought since you're sensitive to the light essence, you would be able to locate them more quickly and we didn't have much time. Let's get back before your tedious brother notices we're missing. 
and he strode off through the orchard, leaving Anne to struggle back in his wake. When Anne got back to the inn, Matthew was nowhere to be seen. She went to the ladies' room to tend to the damage done by her walk through the orchard. She used some paper towels to clean the mud from her shoes, and finding the branch had torn a hole in her pantyhose, removed them and threw them into the trash can. She wasn't sure why, but she wanted to keep her visit to the orchard with Garrick Manser a secret. When she got back to the sitting room, the party was breaking up, and Manser was sulking on the front porch, waiting for the bus to be brought around. When they boarded, Manser took a seat in the back while Mike, Anne's brother, chose one for the front for himself and Anne. What happened to your stockings, he asked, dropping into the seat next to her. Only a gay guy would notice something like that. I got a runner and threw them away. Mike took a sip from what looked and smelled like the remains of a scotch on the rocks and said contemplatively, I would have thought straight guys would be more likely to notice missing stockings. Anne was vaguely irritated that Mike was willing to take her explanation at face value. It took her adventure in the orchard and turned it into a sartorial inconvenience. Then she realized why she wanted to keep her experience with Mass or a secret. It was the first time in her life that she had shared the experience of sensing spirits with another person, even if the way they had experienced it had been quite different. Mass had sought her out to share the experience, had in fact required her assistance. It had involved a kind of intimacy. In comparison to Mazur's talents, her own were puny, like a parlor trick. But far from making her feel inadequate or jealous, it gave her a feeling of comfort, that she was not alone in her abilities, and that there was someone she might look to for guidance in how to navigate the normal world from her abnormal perspective. Then she heard a murmuring query from the back of the bus, and Mazur's response, Don't be an imbecile! And smiling slightly, perhaps decided that perhaps Garrett Mazur should not be her sole model for managing her relationships with her fellow mortals. <laughs> Rachel Claire Evans hails from Lebanon, PA. Honest, any hall I get. Lebanon. How did I do it? Le Lebanon? Okay. Where she spent. Honest, any hall I get. Thank you. <laughs> Where she spent her formative years. She received her high school diploma from Linden Hall at Lidditz, Pennsylvania, and her Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from Juniata College in Huntington, Pennsylvania. Although fulfillment of her literary dreams may still be in the future, she received her Master of Fine Arts degree from Rosemont College in 2007. April Clare has been employed in various capacities over the years and has lived in Joyce and North Carolina. She has hopes that all her experiences may yet to prove to be grist for the writing mill. April Santa. 
Ted is real. He's a ghost that brings fear to every house. Scrawling letters written by nicotine stained hand. Skin raw red and freckles, nails broken and yellow. Still, the puppy dog eyes gleam with wonder and delight as he writes the words in red on the dry erase board. Listen, Jeremiah, listen. Santa Claus is a ghost. He goes through this house and then another house. That's how he can get to all the houses. Jeremiah, in the kitchen, tearing open packet after packet, sweetened though, doesn't seem too impressed or too interested. He looks up knowingly with vague amusement at his fellow president, Henry, as if to say, what the do he know, idiot? <laughs> Jeremiah sashes too much milk on his cereal and pours a generous glass. He cuts the overripe banana with a spoon, letting each piece plop into the bowl in succession. He spoons it and slurps it all in, milk puddling at the corner of his mouth and dribbling onto his long white beard his brown brow furled in rapt concentration. There's a puddle of milk and glazing of fine white powder on the almond formica tabletop that I'll have to clean up later. But for now, the toothless gums gleam through the ever-present stubble. See, Santa Claus is a ghost. That's how he can come down the chimney and bring presents and he bring him and he brings everything you want. And what does Henry want? The simple things, a pack of Winchesters, a stud leather bracelet. Three years ago, it was a $200 pair of leather moccasins, pants weighed, laced up to the knee. Sold to Jeremiah for $20 and a pack of cigarettes. Sold back for $80, and then to Jimmy, who had them for nothing. Last year was the Harley Davidson jacket, which he wore to bed every night of um, what does he really want? Maybe it's what he once said when he was frustrated at not being allowed to hold his own cigarettes. He'd smoked in the house a fire hazard, not allowed. I'm 38 years old, 38 years old. I'm a man, I'm a man. I should be able to hold my own cigarettes to be a man. Okay. And the final poem this evening is also the final poem of my thesis. It's kind of a reaction to the five years of serving at, Car at the Killing House for located in Cote. And it is called Knowing Rest. Can broken minds be mended even with the super glue of sleep? Souls shattered like crystal goblets, lying in thousands of pieces in the dirt and debris. Slumber restores. Help what dreams come. Does the nighttime vista match the daytime nightmare? Does it gallop onward through dawn, daylight, dusk, dead of night? Crushing minds like discarded Coke bottles under iron shot hooves. One day, all the shards will be collected and sorted, pieced together and made whole. When eyes that dark suspicion and hold dark, ireful looks close forever, then those eyes will open again to see always. Their minds to know. Marietta Marietta Fisher appreciates classical literature such as Charles Dickens, John Steinbeck, and Fyodor Dostoevsky. She writes for the enjoyment of expressing oneself and for the thrill of good conversation. Tonight she will present a short writing piece originally created from a writing exercise. Marietta.
Can everybody hear me? Yep. People in the back? Yep. Yes. Okay. The lotus flower. With easy strokes, she moved the brush, brush across the page, dipping the fine tooth back into the ink. With an insightful eye, the white-haired woman moves swiftly over the cream-colored paper, creating new lines until the long, narrow neck emerged into a full-bodied crane. You see, child, you must move the brush quickly, with decisive, clear motion. Keep it in one place for too long, the ink will spread until there is a giant blotch. Move too fast, and the lines will lose their grace and meaning, and then the entire picture is ruined. Taking the girl's hand, the older woman placed the brush in between her tiny fingers, holding her still over the inkwell for a moment before guiding her above a new piece of paper. Gently, she eased the untrained, unsteady hand until the girl became comfortable with the feeling and motion of the brush. See the brush as an extension of your body. Let the lines flow as an expression of yourself. Loosening her grip, the older woman let the child have a bit more freedom to fill out each stroke. With hands still close together, several lotus flowers came blooming out of the white pages until finally the woman let go and allowed the child to paint on her own, praising the good strokes and pointing out the sloppy ones, all while passing on her worldly wisdom. Above all practice, even if you make hundreds of mistakes, without those mistakes you will never grow to find success. Halfway through painting, the first lotus with her own hand, a soft knock at the door caused the child to jump, sending a thick line across the unfinished flower. As the door opened, her mother entered the bedroom, carrying a basket of laundry. The elegant voice filled the small space as the young girl remained seated on the floor alone. Josie, what are you doing? Body frozen, still holding the brush in the air, Josie looked back to where the old woman sat moments before, finding nothing but an empty space, as her mother made her way across the room. Sitting the basket down on the pink flower to bread spread, the tall woman's eyes shimmered as she glanced over the mess of paper scattered about, each flashed with random colors of paint. Bending over to gently brush the golden hair away from her daughter's face, the woman let out a sigh that only a worried mother could give. Honey, what did mommy tell you about closing the door? A warm smile forever graced her rosy face as she knelt down and hugged her first born child. You should go outside and play with the other children. Peering over the small shoulders, the woman became still. Her words vanished. Staring at the picture of the crane and the lotus flowers, she picked them up one by one. Her eyes grew large which eat with each piece of paper, and her mouth hung open. Struggling with her speech, she finally managed to say, What on earth? Yeah. Josie, did you make these? Her mother always knew Josie was special. But as the seven-year-old stared up in silence, yeah. always in silence, no one ever understood just how gifted she really was. Virginia Gunther, did I say that right? Gunther? Yes, thank you. Author of the early 19th century historical novel, Reverberation, the novel, Virginia Gunther, who writes as B.B. Holmes, has worked as an editor, writer, researcher, and publisher of a monthly guide to cultural events in the Philadelphia area. Virginia Gunther. Monday, August 18th, 1828. 
Oh, it's, it's does it work? Oh, it does. Okay, I, I thought you turned it off. Uh, the old musket recoiled against her shoulder as Esther stood firm and the ball stayed its course. Pain from the impact of the gun stock radiated across her chest and up her back. Gray smoke from the ignition of the charge seared her eyes. The acrid smell of scorched gunpowder burned her nostrils. It was, however, the accompanying sound that immobilized her. The deafening report reverberated around her. It penetrated her skull, numbed her brain, stamped her mind with its sinister implications. The amplified explosion culminated in mental shockwaves which overrode the physical discomfort of the discharge. The sound continued to assail Esther as it echoed off the brown, the gray stone house across the path, ricocheted off the towering facade of the adjacent wooden barn, beat at her from the woods which provided her shelter. The blast seemed to repeat itself as, uh, the, the blast seemed to repeat itself, the clatter re resonating once again, heightening her consciousness of her single shot, underscoring her unwelcome awareness of the malevolence of her deliberate act. New sounds coming from the direction of her target steadied Esther. Voices, female voices cried out. A sob, a broken plea for help, fight with frightened whinnies and the muffled pounding of hooves striking the hard packed earth. She raised her eyes and looked at the Squire Richard Holt, the man who had been in her sight. He sat straight in the saddle of his rearing horse. My shot, she said the words aloud. It went wild. Esther's initial disappointment was replaced by an unexpected feeling of relief. She stared at the squire as his horse flailed the air with its hooves before landing on the path in front of the imposing stone residence. No, my shot was true. She spoke in a whisper as she watched her victim grasp his shirt with his right hand and slump sideways in the saddle. A red stain spread across the white fabric and Esther winced as Richard Holt loosed his grip and relaxed his soiled fingers. The round reared again, and the stricken man fell to the ground, one foot twisted in the stirrup. The horse, confused by the loss of its rider, returned to standing. It glanced down at the prostrate horseman and then bolted, dragging the limp body behind him. Esther's chest tightened, bile rose in her throat. The scene swirled around her, and then returned in sharp focus when she heard the sound of someone running near her. Her uncharacteristic emotionalism evaporated, and she was instantly on guard. She turned her head and looked over her right shoulder. A scant 50 feet to her rear, she glimpsed the figure of her brother-in-law. A long gun clasped to his chest, he pushed through the tall brush and struggled to run from the scene. Esther was shocked to see James Dolan. A short time ago, the two of them had been sitting in her keeping room. She had intentionally kept her visitor well supplied with rum as she outlined the plan she and her husband Elias had discussed before his arrival. Unfortunately, she had been overly generous with her spirits, and by the time she had finished explaining her scheme, James had collapsed, too drunk to comprehend her proposed conspiracy. Seeing him behind her and recalling the eerie echo of her solitary blast, Esther realized he must have, apparently or not, acted upon her proposition. Two shots had been fired at the square. One had come from the musket she carried, the other from the firearm handled by James Daunt. At least one of those two shots had found its mark. Uncle, no, uncle. He was hit by lightning. I saw the flash. I heard the crack. No, he was shot. Look at his chest. Help. We need help. Esther returned her attention to the scene in front of the main house. The female voices belonged not to adults, but to Richard Holt's two young wards, the daughters of his recently deceased younger brother. The horse had ended its frightened flight and come to stand in front of the children. Squire Holt's foot was still held captive in the stirrup, and Esther watched as the older girl labored to walk, work it free. Her sister, hands covering the lower part of her face, stood staring at the bloody, dirt-encrusted body of her guardian. Choking on soundless screams, she turned, 
and ran to the house where she was finally able to cry out for help. Esther's stomach heaved at the sight of the young girls and the mangled corpse of their uncle. Sharp pains, accompanied by nausea, surged, surged through the trunk of her body. She folded her arms under her breasts and bent to relieve the torment. Only once before had she experienced such physical and mental discomfort. Then, as now, her anguish had been the result of a spontaneous act of indiscretion. Lori Henson is a woman who is prideful, successful, and stressed out. She knew she could do anything, but felt pressure to do everything. She was a super gal until the tragic night when her superpowers failed, just when she needed them the most. Lori is the author of Super Gal vs. God, inspirational speaker, blogger, and a recovering super galaholic. <laughs> she is a wife, mother, nana, and retired business owner. Lori and her husband have five grown children and 11 grandchildren and live in Phoenixville. Lori Vincent. disadvantage of being far-sighted and near-sighted at the same time. <laughs> I'm just going to start at the beginning and give you a little flavor. So we open at December 31st, 1999. What did you say? I can hardly hear you. Supergal stabbed at the buttons of the walkie-talkie, clipped to the neckline of her dress with one hand, and steered her car with the other. The, the kid's comedian, the TV guy, hasn't shown up, Erica yelled and he's due on stage in 15 minutes. My 19-year-old daughter, Erica, had been pressed into service as a stage volunteer this evening. <coughs> Are you serious? Give me a break. Supergal slammed her hand on the car's dashboard. I gave him strict instructions to be here 45 minutes before showtime. Moron, I'll be there in five. Supergal threw her car into gear and peeled out into the night. She was on her way to resolve the problem on her way to save the day again. It was gee, only the seventh frantic call from one of the volunteers, and the event was just getting underway. Supergal shook her head in disgust. Was there no one else in the world, aside from her, who could follow instructions, read the emails, act responsibly? How hard was that? She pulled up to the curb in front of the local Catholic school, where some of the night's events would take place. The placard on her dashboard gave her the right to park anywhere she wanted, even illegally, but just for this evening. Power trip, baby. The police knew she was running the show tonight and had handed out only a few special permits to the committee members. Once out of the car, Supergal took a moment to smooth her full-length black evening gown with her hands and push back her hair from her face. As she did, a few sparkles from her dress migrated to her forehead. Her black Doc Martin ankle boots, paired with the long gown she thought, gave her an artsy hipster vibe. As <laughs> sure, she could have worn jeans and sneakers knowing she would be on the run for the entire evening, but no. Wouldn't happen, not super gal. Not only must she efficiently run her corner of the world, but she must look cool while doing so. Besides, the media had arrived at the event in full force. Someone was sure to snap her photo for tomorrow's newspaper. It was, after all, a big night. Maybe one of the biggest ever. New Year's Eve, 1999, the brink of a new millennium. And the dawn of a new era for Supergal. Now, she knew nothing about that. She only knew that she needed to pull off this huge event tonight. She'd spent many hard and frustrating hours over the last seven months making sure it would be perfect. It had better be or she had someone's head. God put down his pen, satisfied. The plan for Supergal was ready, but he would implement it ever so slowly. He wasn't ready to tip his hand. He would break it to her gently. Supergal, well, at least my own middle-aged version of her, minus any skimpy leotard or patent leather boots. At age 45, I was still cute, Attractive sounds so, I don't know, middle-aged. 
I was physically active and had lots of life in me. I could rock a cute suit with stylish accessories, of course, like nobody's business. Super gal, booyah. Successful career, check. Community leader, check. Empty nest mother of two grown daughters and one six-year-old granddaughter, uh-huh. Popular, accomplished, check, check, and oh, you get the picture. Oh, entangled in a 25-year teenage marriage that had been unhealthy from the start, check. But this super gal was determined to tackle whatever life threw her way. And she could do it all by herself. She didn't need anyone's help to solve her problems, by golly. She would pull herself up by her bootstraps, as she had always done. No matter the obstacle, here's Supergal. God watched and slowly shook his head. Who did she think had given her the bootstraps? <laughs> Mary Johns attend, attended both business school and Penn State. She held various office jobs from file clerk to receptionist to secretary to administrator to customer service representative, all while raising two generations and caring for an elderly parent. She remains an avid reader and is the author of poems, songs, and short stories. She initiated a newsletter and currently conducts interviews and writes a monthly column. It often can be found in the Phoenixville Library Thank you. Tapping on a borrowed laptop or browsing through its bookshelves. Rosemary Johns. This is titled The 35 Cent Card. Wanting to purchase a greeting card, a mother took her young child to the drugstore. It was the 1950s, and the drugstore sold the usual medicines, of course, but they also with fine china, crystal glassware, and other fragile, expensive knickknacks. They sold greeting cards, too. It took a while for the woman to locate a card that was just right. And then she decided to browse the gift items on display. Wanting to get a better look at some of the more fragile items, she put the 35 cent video card into her purse. When the mother was done shopping, she drove home with her child. On opening her purse, to receive her house keys, the mother discovered the greeting card that she had forgotten to purchase. She immediately made a decision that her child would never forget. Because at this point, the woman had three options. First, she could, get, she could forget about it. Since it was only a 35 cent card, surely the busy drugstore could absorb the loss of just one card. But this would have been dishonest. Second, she could make a mental note to pay for the card the next time she went by or to that drugstore. Then she could explain what had happened to pay for the card. This would be honest if she didn't forget the matter in the meantime. Third, she could return to the drugstore now, explain her mistake, and pay for the 35 cent card. Then she could forget all about it, which is exactly what she did. She never spoke about the incident, but what a lesson she taught without even saying anything. The third option demonstrated integrity, and her daughter learned an important difference between the two. Thanks, Mom. Mm -hmm. And Yeager, I say that one right? A.K.A. Sweet Annie Land is a poet, songwriter, and life enthusiast. Her music and poetry range from You Go Girl soaring ballads to quirky Laugh Your Butt Off parodies. She was a top five winner in the country category of the 2012 Great American Song Contest and a finalist in the adult contemporary category. She was a finalist in the lyric category in 2009 and lives in Glenmore with her husband Scott, children Josie and Luke, and cat Lily. She is currently working on a YouTube video to complement her quirky brand of half music, half poetry. 
Also due to appear this year uh, on her soon-to-be launched YouTube channel, Sweet Anyland, is Baby Got Buns, a parody of Baby Got Back with Star Wars characters. And wants to thank you for being here tonight to hear her work. Dan Younger.
With a background in accounting and finance, Lisa started her consulting firm in 1999 and has worked with small and medium business on finance, strategic vision, and her own concept of sustainable business practices she calls systems evolution. Making the leap from political junkie to political activist, Lisa was one of the over 1,200 arrested at the first Tar Sands action at the White House on September 3, 2011, and credits that event with inspiring her to make the leap to activist. Since that day in September 2011, Lisa has been writing and speaking on these issues and hopes her activism and writing will motivate others to do the same. Lisa Long. When the story of your life is told, no one will care which team you supported or where you shopped. No one will care if you went to the big game or the big sale. It won't matter how much money you saved shopping at that big box store or how much you spent on those tickets and jerseys. No one is going to remember or care who you voted for to be an idol or who danced with those stars. They won't remember who survived the survivor. No one will be impressed that you played Call of Duty, or even that you ran out to buy a gun after 20 children were murdered. That one gets it. No one will remember that you wished things were different. No one will remember you for that day you stood for hours in line, or the time you spent online to save a few dollars on stuff you didn't need, stuff made with child and slave labor. They won't, they won't care that you meant well, or that you donated a few dollars in your spare time. No one will remember that you love the idea of fairness, equality, justice, but you were just too busy to do anything about it. What will matter is what you actually stood for, how you changed the world, how you left your mark. What you actually did is all that will matter. Think about who you admire, who you remember, who you are grateful existed and then honor them with your life. Your action, your ability, and your values. Don't tell me you don't have time, because I don't know very well just how little time we have. Every day I am faced with the reality of one less day to accomplish what needs to be done. The reality of the shortness of life is one I cannot escape. To wake up every day and realize one less day I have with my daughter, one less day to be heard. We only have so many days. And I'm going to ask each of you, when they tell the story of your life, will it be more repeated? Septibus mechanic, originally from Philadelphia, now living in Coatesville. Last April he had a stroke, and before that he was an avid bicyclist who, now due to his physical limitations, has returned to his love of the arts, specifically painting and writing poetry as a wonderful way to keep busy. Frank Perone.
I shed a tear at the sound of taps. I stand tall, but the hem of my core is sung. I feel joy in the success of my children. I find pleasure in the simple things. I feel pain and hate. I also feel love. I suffered from grief. I buried a wife. But I will survive and thrive. I have known fear. Now I know hope. I am the soul of a poet. I am the spirit of a warrior. I pray for peace. I am a man. This next piece, I'm assuming, although assumptions can be dangerous, that everyone has heard the quote, the pen is mightier than the sword. Correct? Okay, along those lines. My name is Sword. I am proud and fierce. I was born in fire and shaped by the hands of an artisan. I fear nothing. When I am unsheathed, I will cut you down. I will cut through flesh and bone. I have destroyed armies. Fear me. My name is Penn. My brother is Peyton. Together we have brought down governments. Nations have trembled at the flow of my name. I have put knowledge on paper and ideas in the mind of man. I will fear you not, sword. I am the power of an idea, and my thoughts will grow in the mind of man. Make no mistake, though you may kill the man, you will never put you an idea. Thank you. Slants of Light from the Women's Writing Circle, a group of women writers who live and work in the Philadelphia area. Ginger is a citizen advocacy coordinator, community organizer, and true believer in the promise and power of civic engagement. She has worked as an English teacher, tutor, and grant writer. She completed her undergraduate work in English at Wesleyan University and holds a master's, master's degree in education from the University of Pennsylvania. She says, I'd like to explore how our voices begin to emerge as we dare to tell our own unique stories. I write to discover the deeper layers of my experience, to sift, sort, and discover a reflection that holds personal and universal experiences all at once. An avid hiker and photographer, she lives in Phoenixville with her three wise feline housemates. Ginger. changed since the two women embarked on careers to change the world. In college, they had endless late-night discussions over coffee and imagined their lives in 5, 10, and 20 years. They felt such conviction and certainty then. The fact that they could and would make their mark was not in question. Now things were not so clear and felt anything but certain. The economic fallout from the Great Recession seemed endless. They knew neighbors, friends, and family who had lost jobs, health insurance, and pension plans. Then there were life events like death, divorce, 
and illness that were definitely not part of the original plan. With each blow, somehow it felt harder and harder to begin again. At some point, their career focus shifted from what fed their hearts to what filled their wallets. Both women had made compromises for what they believed were jobs that would provide financial security and at least some measure of professional satisfaction. Before deciding to accept the job at Catch a Star, Carla had debated long and hard. Should she leave the part-time job she loved at the local after-school program she had created for the security of a full-time position with an enviable benefits package? Serena, whose passion was summer camp programming for girls, soon realized that sustaining herself and her son on three part-time jobs without benefits, just so she could go back to camp the next summer, was definitely not a sane option. Eventually, she settled for a coaching career at Girls High in Philadelphia. At least there, she could be outside most of the time while helping girls build their confidence and leadership skills in the competitive sports arena. Serena sighed. So, she ventured, any ideas about what's next? Honestly, Carla replied, I don't. I used to have so many ideas. I used to think people would be interested in my ideas and what I had to say. Now, I feel most of the time people nod and smile as if they're listening, but they're not. Maybe if I go out on the nearest street corner and start stripping, I might get some attention. Ah, yes, Serena responded. I guess there'll always be a market for our skills in that arena, right? Listen to us, Carla exclaimed, sitting bolt upright in her chair. We sound like we're done. Take us out of the oven, please. Darkness gently seeped into the sky, and lightning bugs appeared, dotting the landscape like pulsing glitter. Serena took a matchbook out of her purse and reached for the citronella candle in a small silver bucket on the chair next to her. With a forceful scrape, she lit a match and placed it over the wick of the candle. As Carla rose from her chair to get another bottle of wine, the phone she had perched in the kitchen window at the end of the garden walk began to ring. Ugh, oh, should I get that, she asked, looking at Serena, who pointed both thumbs down, mimicking a pained expression. Sighing, Carla hurried up the walkway and disappeared inside. Serena was left to ruminate while staring into the flame of the lone candle, which now sat in the middle of the table, glowing softly. So unfair, she thought. Carla's worked so hard all these years, but working hard is not enough. Having a stellar performance record is not enough. Taking on more responsibilities with less pay is not enough. God, she thought, how pathetic that it all gets reduced to numbers. And when your number's up, you go. Guess what, Carla called through the kitchen window. Serena turned to see her friend waving a piece of paper on the other side of the screen. What? She had answered cautiously. Carla pushed the door open with her shoulder, a basket of pretzels balanced on one, in one arm, and a fresh bottle of white wine in the other. So that was Sam from Catch a Star, and he said they posted a new position in the New York office on Friday. You have to be kidding me. You would not actually consider working again at the same place that just dumped you, right? I don't know. The funny thing is, it's the same position I begged them to create because I knew I could support the local school programs and wanted to start for our teachers in Philly. Hell, I practically wrote the job description and posted. I just printed out Stan's email, she said, waving a sheet of paper triangle. You would seriously consider this position. After everything that's happened, Serena's voice started to rise in pitch. And you do realize that you'd be working with the angels of death again, she added for dramatic flair. They had given the human resources director and her assistants this moniker after the second round of layoffs when they appeared unannounced in offices across the country to begin the cutbacks. After proffering a manila envelope with the requisite legal documents to each newly released employee, the angels accompanied these poor souls to their desks with their belongings and asked them to leave the Carla would never forget the starkness of losing her professional identity with this rote set of gestures. He walked in the building as a professional and out the door as an unemployment statistic. After they settled at the table again, Carla sat staring at the email. Okay, Carla said slowly. Serena felt uneasy as she watched her friend. She held her breath, waiting for either an argument in favor of returning to the organization or fallout from the crushing realization that this was an absurd idea after all. She was totally unprepared for what came next. What if, Carla continued, what if I just forget the foundation and keep the job posting? And to what purpose, Serena asked, looking increasingly skeptical. Well, it's the job I've always wanted, Rini. You know working with 
volunteers is where my heart is. Carla got up from her chair and walked into the garden where she gently captured one of the lightning bugs in her hand. She returned to the table and sat down, spreading her fingers just enough to see the glow inside without releasing the tiny creature. Just exactly did we, when did we stop dreaming, Rainy, she queried. At what point did we actually give up on what we loved? Maybe this whole economic meltdown is just some big reassignment going on, Carla suggested. And now I'm finally getting a chance to find the organization that will hire me for the job I've created. Maybe I'm the one who's supposed to be interviewing company candidates that I'll hire to help me with my own mission. How's that for cosmic reframe, she asked, looking over at Serena, whose expression reflected a mixture of amusement and affection. Serena gazed at the tiny pulsations of light inside Carla's hands. Her, fan, her friend exasperated and fascinated her, all at the same time. She could not quite get her mind around it, but Carla had this quality of endurance that helped her weather the storms while still be, being able to imagine, in the midst of the gale, a time when the skies were clear and the seas would again be tranquil. And it wasn't in some clueless Pollyanna way where you knew that she was oblivious. She knew the score. It's just that she didn't focus on it as the ultimate result. is a native of Pottstown, but grew up mostly in Westchester, where he still lives. He's a late bloomer who, at 61, has been writing poetry since his 30s, had several published locally. He writes about anything and everything, very old-fashioned and patriotic. He works as a caregiver on day job and has been acting in local theater at The Forge a few times. He's a late blooming graduate of Immaculata University in 2009. Oh, and he goes by the pen name Jack Robertini, the last name being similar to his original Italian family name before his grandpa changed it. Jack Roberts. Hello. The name business always trips me out. I just guess I'll say I'm Jack. And uh, it's good to be behind the microphone again. Um, I have written all kinds of things, but uh, that mostly poems with me tonight because I think that's what I'm best at. Um, and let's see. I'll tell you what to go with my Italian roots. I'll start with the with the one that wasn't going to be first. <laughs> Alchemy. What a beautiful sight. Starting simply, I take the long yellow strands out of the box. They're plain cardboard prison. Into an equally plain white pot, I drop them. But there, the magic takes place. On my humble little stove, the stalks of grain are liberated, swirling in their hot bath, stirred and separated. They change into the treasure of the gods. As the boiling water softens, caresses, and infuses them with new life, I am in turn changed from an ordinary man into the keeper of the flame, the husband of my ancestors' art. For there, in the magic pot, strands of semolina are triumphantly reborn as spaghetti! <laughs> Hail Caesar! Didn't tell him an act or two. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think if I do a lot of driving, and I wish I didn't have to. I think it's a tedious chore, but I decided to do this with a sense of humor, and I call it the riddle of the road. Oh, Mr. Turtle, I do not see why you drive so slowly in front of me. Do you not have a job, or a wife, or a hobby? I guess you do not, and my head's getting throbbing. Oh, Mrs. Speedy. I do not see why you drive so pushy in back of me. I know I'm not really driving too slow, and you probably really have nowhere to go. I wish we could all learn to drive the same speed, so if turtles or pushers there would be no more need. If we could all be in the same, same driving mode, we just might solve the riddle of 
it's a it's a poem I wrote about um, a uh, brownstone, I guess, um, uh, in, 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 uh, along one of the streets here in Phoenixville. And I thought the thing is, um, I was maybe a little critical of the people that lived in the house, maybe a little bit prejudicial. Uh, I've been in. I lived in Phoenix for a long time, and it seems like uh, the, the restaurants finally came along and solved a lot of problems. Yeah. It's called Remember the Traffic. A bell chimes on the porch of a good, kind citizen I will never meet. This person is a member of a community I will never be a part of. We will never dance together or skip rocks on the lake in this twilight after a hot summer day. It is winter now, but I can imagine them, a husband and wife, with a couple of 10, 12 year olds kicking back in the porch in matching rocking chairs. Of course, they will be drinking lemonade, but it, not, but it will not be from the stands in memory of that little girl that died from pediatric cancer not too long ago. They made it themselves in their own kitchen using real lemons and water and sugar. They have an actual kitchen, one that has evolved over time, one that isn't necessarily made completely out of stainless steel. The stove is an antique white with the original knobs from 1962, and a deep sink that is separate from everything else, where you pile up the dishes in pots that have to be scrubbed. They won't fit in the dishwasher, the most modern appliance in the kitchen. Sadly, I will never meet these people, and they are the kindest of souls. Their children are well-mannered, well-adjusted, and friendly and trusting. The Father provides for them, and is firm, and doesn't spoil them. Everyone has a laptop computer and their own room, hardwood floors. This is an old house, stone exterior, built some time in the 1930s, maybe. Drafty, but solid overall. Uh, leaks in the little in the attic, make sure that the boxes are secure and shut properly. That's a special way the boxes do when the flaps fold in alternative, or alternately. The bell I spoke of in the beginning is a wind chime, actually. A breeze came through just so that the two clinked on the knocker just once, and I was there to hear and write about it. But I, like to bury, but I like to write about harsher things, like driving snowstorms, trash pickup, and snarling cross-town traffic. That's what I like, the hustle and bustle. You wouldn't believe the crowds in New York City unless you've been there. Philadelphia doesn't compare, and Phoenixville doesn't really compare either. But it's where I'm living now, and paying taxes. It is not the sleepiest town, however, Remember the trap? Um, this uh, might be uh, turning up the, uh, approaching the PG-13 maybe. <laughs> uh, it's mostly really about um, drinking a little bit. <laughs> um, it's called Old Men Having Problems With Sleep. It occurs to me that some old men do not sleep well. Not that they toss and turn, but they have to get up in the pre-dawn hours and put on the robe and walk to the door of the house and considering and consider going out into the fog to commune with the dew in the half-light. Maybe they have to take sleeping pills or hits of scotch to get to sleep in the first place. This seems that it could be my inheritance, however, that I could spend most of my golden years fumbling around my environs half asleep, sleepy, troubled, worried, scaring and wondering if I'm safe, forgetting that I am. It occurs to me that the reason these men are not sleeping in the first place is that they have had too much to drink and they are fighting off the sleeplessness of a hangover. This is because they are either alcoholics or something has troubled them deeply and their social drinking has gone too far. It further occurs to me that I might be safer or more restful if I don't drink heavily and become an alcoholic into my later years. That I might spend less time, that I might spend less time 
trying to fall back asleep at 5.30 in the morning and more time dreaming of walking the dog and afternoons in the fragrant fleeting summer. Uh, this last one is called um, I'm Never Traveling to Europe. I don't know if uh, everybody should really feel sorry for me. <laughs> Um, I have seen every brick in every cobblestone street, in every sleepy European town I will never get to visit. I have seen every step, I have seen every stone of every building that abuts the street and snakes back along the alley into darkness. I have seen excitement, I have seen culture, I have seen life lived to the fullest that I will never experience. How have I seen these things? Movies and books mostly also photographs and paintings. My mind has created a world of its own that I tend to call Europe, and if I never get there, my greatest wish will, conf will go unfulfilled. If I never ride a horse, if I never go up in a hot air balloon, if I never see the Pacific Ocean, these things will not be as bad as never going to Europe. Thank you. Donna Wilhelm lives and works in Phoenixville. She loves reading and writing and is trying to dedicate, dedicate more time to both. Donna Wilhelm. Um, when you're nervous, being at the end of the alphabet, not a good thing. <laughs> um, this is untitled, but it's a personal essay. When I was in college 30 years ago, I knew exactly how my life was going to play out. I was going to be a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I was going to be in the thick of where it was all happening, gathering news and telling people what they needed to know. It was going to be my contribution to society. I might not get there right away. I had to pay my dues, after all, before I reached such an illustrious goal. There would be gigs at smaller papers first, maybe a stint in radio news. But right before I graduated, something happened. I got a part-time proofreading job in medical publishing. The pay was great for that time, $7 an hour. How could I say no to that kind of money? One editorial job outside of news media led to another, and before I knew it, I had carved out a career for myself. I was good at it. And the perks, you mean this cubicle is mine, all mine? I get a nameplate, sign me up. Also along the way, I met a guy, fell in love, got married, had children. We bought a house in the suburbs and gave a rescue dog a forever home. I was making good money at yet another medical publishing job. Our younger son had been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder when he was three and when he started kindergarten, I quit my job to be a stay-at-home mom. As anyone will tell you, living on one income is not easy. I had to get at least a part-time job, preferably here in town, since we were down to one car, which my husband needed to get to his job in West Conchahawken. That's how I ended up at the Gateway. The Gateway Pharmacy has been a Phoenixville landmark since the 1950s and has been owned by the same two families since 1982. It is a beacon of trusted service in the community. I didn't expect to take to the job so well. For the most part, I'm an introvert. I'm shy with people until I feel comfortable around them. But as long as I had this job, I wanted to be good at it. I made it my mission to remember the names of regular customers. You'd be surprised how disconcerting this was to some people. Apparently, having a rapport with your pharmacist is one thing. Having a rapport with your pet pharmacy cashier is just disturbing. <laughs> oh, you know my name? I must be in here too often. To which I reply, well, no, I just think it's nice to go somewhere and have people know your name. That usually gets a smile. Not everyone is interested in the niceties. My boss put it into perspective for me. No one really wants to be here, he said. They're here because either they are sick or they're caring for someone who's sick. When I can, though, I try to win people over. And I'm happy to say that I've succeeded with several customers. Some of them have even asked me my name. One of our elderly customers said to me, they need to keep you and give you a raise. You're a treasure. Which is now my nickname at work. Treasure. <laughs> treasure will help. It's a nice thought, but it sounds like a German stripper. <laughs> I love joking with the customers. 
I love making them smile. I love sharing in their joy, like when they tell me they've just had their first baby or they're getting married. The flip side is that I also share their pain. Things like, I had to put my husband in a home. My dad had a heart attack. My wife passed away. I was just diagnosed with cancer. That's when it's hard. And I listen sympathetically and nod and tell them I'm sorry, knowing that's pretty much all the comfort I can give. In between, there are the slices of life that keep us updated on each other and connected. Who moved? Who's back in town? How the parents are doing? How the kids are doing? How good or bad the school district is? How good or bad the borough is? How Obamacare is directly responsible for their high co-payment and will surely be the ruin of us all? Underneath it all is the strong, steady heartbeat of a lively community, and I'm proud to be a part of it. I think back on my work experience since I left college, and I realized that in my cubicle with my nameplate, I never knew how my work affected anyone. I was sure someone out there was grateful for my careful editing, but it never came back to me. At least now I know that if I'm doing my job right, I'm making someone's day a little more bearable. And you know, I'm not that far off from my original goal. I'm telling people what they need to know. I am in some small way contributing to society. I am in the thick of it. Life, death, sickness, health, and everything in between. And it all happens at the gateway. And last but not least, Rich Wilhelm lives in Phoenixville with his wife Donna, their sons Jimmy and Chris, and their dog Jolie. He writes about any number of things, and this writing sometimes appears on his longtime blog, The Dichotomy of the Dog. In addition, Rich is a certified volunteer tour guide at Laurel Hill Cemetery, a National Historic Landmark in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. Rich Wilhelm. This is called Rosary Beads and Lemon Heads. April 1974. Richard Nixon was President of the United States, not for much longer. Seasons in the Sun, a pop tune about young people having joy and fun and then dying, sung by some guy named Terry Jacks, was spilling out of AM radio stations from coast to coast. <coughs> However, in a third grade classroom in a Catholic, a Catholic elementary school in the southeast corner of Pennsylvania, the only music to be heard was that of an anonymous cowboy singing the multiplication tables over and over again. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. Two times four is eight. If you listen closely, another sound, nearly imperceptible, could be detected in that classroom. The soft clickety-clack of colorful plastic beads being removed from clear plastic bags and strung together in rows of ten, separated by a plastic bar, another bead, and then one more plastic bar. Sister Mary Adrian's class was making rosaries again. Sister Mary Adrian was my third grade teacher. The bolder, more troublemaking, surely hellbound kids in our class shockingly referred to her as just Adrian. The rest of us called her, called her Stir, that peculiar Catholic school kid pronunciation of the word sister used only when referencing a nun. For the purposes of this story, I'll call her SMA. Three times two is six, three times three is nine, three times four is twelve. SMA was rather ill-tempered and, in retrospect, clearly one odd nun. Her eccentricity manifested itself in the hundreds of rosaries her class produced. My mother has told me that when, when I arrived home from school, telling her how many rosaries we made that day, she thought I meant how many times we prayed the rosary. Mom eventually realized what I was talking about when I brought home a sample of my work. Rosary making had been a central purpose of SMA's third grade class since the school year had begun. Throughout a typical day, regular classwork would cease and rosary making commenced. It was perfectly reasonable to make rosaries during religion class, but with the singing cowboy crooning the times tables, 
Math class became a time for beads and bars as well. Besides, you had to know how to count the correct number of beads, right? That's math. Even social studies could work for bead crafting, since the rosaries were allegedly being shipped off to poor children in distant mission labs. And why would we have any reason to believe otherwise? It's not like there was some kind of domestic black market for plastic rosaries made by Harold Graders, even in the 1970s. Four times two is eight. Four times three is 12. Four times four is 16. In addition to her rosary production expertise, SMA was the czarina of our school's thriving candy concession. Though it seems inconceivable by today's weight-conscious, dentally correct standards, in 1974, candy was sold at recess and lunchtime. <laughs> Selected students roamed the schoolyard, carrying boxes that usually held sugary confections from the Ferrera Pan line of quality candies including my personal favorite, Lemonheads. The unspoken mission of these kid candy peddlers, to relieve their classmates of every stray coin they had, <laughs> perhaps to finance the purchase of more rosary craft supplies. Somehow, I became SMA's right-hand man in the candy cartel. After eating my peanut butter sandwich, I'd often spend the rest of my lunch period sorting change and filling up coin wrappers with the pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters that had so recently been whisked away from my classmates. At that time, it was easy to still find buffalo nickels and Indian head pennies in any random stack of change, and SMA would let me trade in my more recent coins so I could add the older ones to my coin collection at home. At the height of my candy henchman days, I was given the responsibility to walk to the local credit union where I would deposit the candy money into, well, into the candy money account, I guess. I suppose I could have been an unwitting patsy in some grand money laundering scheme, <laughs> in which the candy money got diverted to a mysterious Swiss bank account that allowed SMA and her nun friends to drive around in increasingly elaborate and expensive station wagons as the 1970s well through its inevitable disco period. However, after 40 years of thinking about this, that scenario seems unlikely. So what did I learn in third grade? I learned the finer points of crafting an exquisite set of plastic rosary beads. I learned about wheeling and dealing in the high-stakes nickel candy financial jungles. Thanks to Terry Jacks, I learned that young people have joy and fun and then die. I learned through Sister Mary Adrian that there are some real characters in this world and, I, and that I was bound to meet a few of them. And of course, I learned my time tables. Thank you. Thank you for coming again. Good night.